Welcome to CTI Online. I'm Holly Batista. My husband and I are the lead pastors here at CTI, and we are so happy that you're here with us. CTI is here to help you find and follow Jesus. So no matter where you are or what you're going through, we pray that this message has something special for you. I encourage you to receive whatever God has in store for you today. This morning, I'm excited to continue in our series. This month, we're going through the book of Esther. And this Old Testament book of the Bible, it tells the story of a young woman named Esther that God strategically positioned in a kingdom at just the right time to save the nation of Israel that was facing annihilation from an evil man that was placed into a position of very high-ranking power. And we'll talk more about this man named Haman today. But to review, last week, if you weren't with us, we discussed the fact that Esther was a Jewish orphan who was living in exile in an unfamiliar land with unfamiliar people. She was adopted by her older cousin named Mordecai, and through a series of events, God brought her into the palace and granted her the role of queen to King Xerxes, who was in charge of the Persian Empire at this time. Now, it was God's favor over her life that gave her this influential voice. And this is God's desire for all of us as his children. He wants to open up doors for us and to give us kingdom influence in every sector of society. I really believe that this morning. And my prayer, our prayer throughout this series, and really throughout this next season, and as we approach this upcoming election is that God would quicken us and make us aware of the places and the people that we have a voice with to uphold the godly standards and the kingdom values that God has called us to as his children. Amen? Amen? Now, we're talking about strategic movement, and last week we, we introduced this theme of the game of chess, a game that is a game of strategic movement. And when it comes to the pieces that are on a chessboard, uh, we would know that this right here, this is a pawn right? And the pawns might seem like they're the smallest and the most insignificant. They don't really possess as much power or mobility as the larger pieces of the game. And really, the pawns, they can only move one space forward at a time where the larger pieces on the board, they can do much more than that. And because of this, many people, when they're playing the game of chess, they'll underestimate the pawn. But an experienced chess player knows that the pawns have great potential and purpose because when they're moved strategically, somebody say strategically, they can protect the most powerful pieces, the king and the queen. And that's exactly what was about to take place in the kingdom that Esther was now the queen of right? She would, they, would, they would not have this happily ever after vibe that we find at the end of chapter two like we did last week. As a matter of fact, chapter three is where things kind of took a turn for the worse concerning Esther and Mordecai, like really, really bad. And that's what we're going to look at today. And you know, when things take a turn for the worse, in moments like this, it's easy for us to feel like God is absent, like he's ignorant, like God might be unaware of what's taking place in our lives. But the reality is, is that God is present even in the darkest moments of our life. And if we turn our attention to him, we'll see that his plan is still to prosper and not to harm, to give a hope and a future. How many believe that this morning? If you believe that, stand up with me this morning and open up your Bibles to Esther chapter 3. And even if you don't believe it, stand up with me. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 today. And this is what the Bible says in Esther chapter 3. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all of the other nobles. Verse 2, all of the royal officials at the king's gate, they knelt down and they paid honor to Haman for the king had commanded this concerning him. But, somebody say but, but Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. 
Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore, they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, and I want you to really grasp the hatred that we read of in verse 6. Yet learning who Mordecai's people were, He scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Jesus, I pray right now that you would help your church, that you would help your children not to be sleeping in this hour that we're living in. God, would you help us to be like the sons of Issachar, who the Bible tells us discerned the times that they were living in. And Father, I ask that your righteous remnant would rise up, O God, that you would anoint us to take our place in this world to hold up the godly standard and the kingdom that we know will never see an end. God, speak to us through the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. This morning, I'm calling this message, The Boldness to Not Bow. And I think it's safe to assume that we all see the contrast from chapter 2. If you didn't see last week's message, you have to catch up on our YouTube channel. You can watch it there. But in chapter 2, Esther, essentially, she wins this beauty contest. She's marked by the favor of God. She's crowned queen. And Mordecai, at the end of chapter 2, was just the hero that uncovered this plot of two people in the kingdom, two people inside the king's cabinet who were planning on assassinating King Xerxes. This is heroic stuff. Mordecai is the one who uncovers this. These are the victories and the highlights for both Esther and Mordecai. And then we turn one page into chapter 3, what we just read this morning. And now we see that Mordecai is under attack from a man named Haman, who just happened to be promoted to a position of great authority by King Xerxes himself. How many would agree that that went south real quick, right? And what triggered it all was that Mordecai decided that he was going to be bold enough to not bow down to evil. How quickly things change. And isn't this true of your life and my life? I don't know about you, but the older that I get, or maybe it's just the more that life kind of develops the way it is, I'm realizing that in the current world that we live in, things change on a dime right? One minute everything is moving in one direction, and then suddenly out of nowhere, everything just kind of shifts. Anybody else feel that, or is that just me? I don't mean to be dramatic. I don't mean to be dramatic this morning, but I feel like we are living in a world that's bouncing around from one extreme to another more rapidly than it used to. And I mean, I get that change is a part of life, but honestly, if I sit down sometimes to catch up on the news and to see what's happening in our world, right, I I flip on the TV, I feel like I have whiplash, right? Like so much happens in the course of a day. This past summer, we were traveling a lot and we had some different ministry uh, commitments. And so I, I turned on the news one day and I found out that in just a matter of a few weeks, there was the attempted assassination of a former president. I found out that the incumbent president had dropped out of the race, the vice president was now campaigning for president, and a third party independent candidate dropped out of the race and endorsed one of his opponents. And when I saw that, I said to myself, how long was I gone for? I mean, this, if this was like a TV show, this wouldn't have just been an episode. This would have been a whole entire series, right? But this all happened in real time, one thing after another. And listen, my goal this morning is not to turn our attention to politics. That's not it. Because the reality is, is that in this room that we're sitting in right now, we all have different political ideology. In the room right now, there's filled with a mix of Republicans and Democrats and independents and maybe a few libertarians. And perhaps there's a good number of people sitting here today or watching online that are so fed up with politics and elections that maybe you've even considered not voting at all. 
Don't do that. Vote. We need to vote. And I get it. I get it that the beauty of America is that we're all free to all be different and have different views and all live in unity with one another, with liberty and justice for all. But you have to admit that the leader of our great nation matters a lot because the decisions that they make, the direction that they lead us in, the things that they are for or against, they impact all of us. And when it comes to who you and I are going to vote for, yes, things like the economy and health care and foreign policy, all of those things are important. All of those things should be considered. But there are other things that I believe that the church of Jesus Christ should place greater value on. And these issues are right or wrong. They are black or they are white. They are moral issues. And as followers of Christ, we simply need to be bold enough to not bow down to certain things we have to understand we have to understand that just because something is legal does not make it moral and does not make it align with God's word and with his truth and although I'm not here I am not here understand my role in this I am not here to push a political agenda but there are some things that have become politicized that don't belong under the the, the label of one particular party. Because the reality is, is that God's word speaks to these things directly. And let me tell you something about this book. This book is not Republican. It is not Democrat. It is not independent. It is not libertarian. It is not undecided. It's for everyone, and it's over and above everything. And so you might say, well, 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 well what are these issues that you're speaking of? I'm going to tell you plainly today, very plainly. I'm going to leave you no room to wonder. The right to life is not a partisan issue. It's a biblical issue from the womb to the tomb, born, pre-born, unborn, near death. All life is valuable. And because God is for life, we have to be on the side of life. We can't bow down to that. Marriage, family, sexuality, gender. This is not a political issue. This is a biblical issue. Why? Because God created family. He created marriage. He created husband and he created wife. Male and female, he created them. And he was not confused about that. And so we should not be confused about that either. We cannot endorse anything that opposes that. We can't bow down to that. When it comes to Israel, this is not a partisan issue. This is a biblical issue. We stand with Israel because God in his word in Zechariah, he says, he who touches Israel touches the apple of my eye. Let me say it this way. There are certain things that as followers of Jesus, we need the boldness to not bow down. And that's what Mordecai is experiencing here. There's this boldness that he has to not bow down to this evil man named Haman. And I want us to understand this morning that there is a difference. And hear me today. There is a difference between boldness and rebellion. Rebellion is not of God. Nor will God bless your rebellion. God is not okay with insubordination. And in many places in his word, it talks about submitting to those who are in positions of authority. But it's different. It's different for the children of God when those in authority operate in opposition to his word because God will not tolerate us going against his word. And this is where we need the boldness to not bow. And Mordecai makes this decision that he will not bow to this evil man, Haman. And the consequences of this, they are not light. They are very, very real. Read with me, starting in verse 8. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, so now Mordecai won't bow. Haman goes to the king. He says, there's a certain people dispersed among the, the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all the other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger, and he gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money 
army, the king said to Haman, and do with these people as you please. Here's what we need to understand today. Evil is a reality. And I understand this probably is not the encouragement that you were looking for when you got out of bed to come to church today. But this is just the truth. Evil is at work in this world. And the reality is that we all have to deal with it. And this is nothing new. From the garden, the enemy has been sowing these seeds of division and destruction into the hearts of men and women. What is his goal? His goal is to draw us away from a loving heavenly father and lead us down a path of separation and suffering. And what's interesting about Haman and Mordecai is that the hatred between them, it actually traces back generations. Would you allow me to give you a little history this morning? If you were to go back into the book of 1 Samuel, we read about an enemy to the people of Israel during the time of King Saul. Everybody remember King Saul, right? Before King David. Now the Amalekites, they were under the rule of King Agag. They were a persistent problem to the children of Israel for a long, long time. The Amalekites, they hated the people of Israel. They hated God's chosen people. They hated the Jews, and they made every attempt that they could to destroy them. And you know what's really interesting is when we, chase, when we trace this through the generations, the Bible tells us that Mordecai, Mordecai, Esther's cousin, right, who's Jewish, comes from the same tribe of Israel that King Saul descended from. And even more interesting than that, this evil man, Haman, he's an Agagite or a descendant of King Agag of the Amalekites, enemies of the Jewish people. Do you see that, how far back this goes? And so now it's no coincidence that there's still this intense hatred of the Jewish people from this man, Haman, because we can trace it back generations. So Haman proposes this plan to King Xerxes, and he says, let's just kill all of the Jews. And the king permits it. And so the wheels start turning, and this decision and there's this proclamation that's now distributed all the way throughout the kingdom. In verse 3, it says, Dispatches were sent by couriers to all of the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate. I'm going to read those again. In order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Destroy, kill, and annihilate. Does that sound familiar to you today? Is this reminiscent of anything else that you've ever read in Scripture before? Because when I hear those words, do you know what I think of? Destroy, kill, and annihilate from the book, the Old Testament book of Esther. It kind of reminds me of the same words that Jesus spoke in the New Testament when he said in John 10.10 10, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full you see the truth is that the enemy of our soul is the author of evil and when Jesus is speaking of the thief he's not talking about a robber he's not talking about some kind of bandit He's talking about Satan himself, the devil, the author of evil and the father of all lies. The Bible says that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion and he's looking for those who he can devour. Everything sinister, everything evil, dark, and demonic, it all traces back to the enemy of our soul. And right now, if you hadn't noticed, he's at work in this world trying to bring death and destruction wherever he can. And this is exactly what Haman is trying to do. And I have more bad news for you today, which I'm sure is what you're looking for. If you choose, and if I choose to take a stand... And if you have the boldness to not bow, and if I have the boldness to not bow to things that are evil and not in alignment with God's truth, guess what? Persecution is probable. I hope you weren't looking for a sugar-coated, feel-good, watered-down message today. And this message might be a little too real, but the truth is that when you and I get on the right side of things, and when we speak up and when we speak out for things that are right and not popular, that does not make our lives any easier. In many ways, actually, 
You know what that makes us? That makes you and I more of a target. And persecution is a very real thing. Mordecai chooses to not bow to an evil man who wanted to do evil things, and that made him a target, and it made his people a target. And before we dismiss this and say, listen, that was thousands of years ago. This is Old Testament, right? We have to remember we're under a new covenant. We are under a new covenant. Jesus established this new covenant. And we have to remember what Jesus said the future would be like for us. Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples right before he died on the cross? You can find it in John chapter 15, verse 18. Listen to what Jesus in the new covenant, in the New Testament, he says to his followers, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, and that's why the world hates you. You see, Jesus was straight up with his disciples. People are going to hate you simply because you belong to me. That's why Jesus preached in his very first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. You can find it in Matthew chapter 5. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. He preached, blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you, when they falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And then Peter, Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect. That was for the people of New Jersey. (laughs) Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Look at verse 17. For it is better... If it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. I'm going to read that again in 2024. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Somebody give him praise this morning. Listen, I know, I know, I know that persecution, I know that suffering is not a popular message. But here's the deal. If we live the way that God has called us to live, and if we refuse to bow down to the evil in this world, and if we choose to take a stand for the things that are righteous and true and God-honoring, there will be consequences. And this is already happening in in places all around the world. Many of our global partners in different countries, some of them in sensitive countries, they're being persecuted for their faith, for their obedience to the Lord. Their churches are targeted. Their families are targeted. Their homes are targeted. I talked to one of our global global partners just recently who told me that one of his colleagues Another missionary from another sending organization was shot right outside of his home in the Middle East, right in front of his wife and his children. Do you want to know why? Because he bore the name of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, we're not too far from this in America. Don't think for a moment that you and I won't have to deal with this. Because as things heat up and as we get closer and closer to the end of this age, there's going to be much opposition and much persecution against the people of God. And this is not new. How many people remember Daniel who lived in Babylon where the king issued a rule that anyone who prayed to any God other than him would be punished. What did Daniel do? The Bible says that Daniel went home and he opened up his windows wide and he prayed to his God in heaven. And what happened to him? He was thrown into the den of lions. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were told that they had to bow down and worship this golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had constructed? And if they didn't bow, they would be punished. What did these three Hebrew children do? The Bible said that everybody else in the kingdom bowed down, but they would not bow down. And what happened to them? They were thrown into the fire. 
And now Mordecai, he's confronted with this persecution of his people. And if you turn to Esther chapter 4, you see, you see the anguish and the pain. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes he put on sackcloth and ashes and he went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly but he went only as far as the king's gate because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and the order of the king came there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and wailing. Many, many lay in sackcloth and ashes and I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine the desperation. I want you to imagine the sorrow, the despair that was felt among this people at this proclamation as it rang throughout the kingdom. The devastation that was about to take place, you know, one year ago as I traveled to Poland and Brother Tim Carlucci was with me. We took a tour and we walked through Auschwitz, a concentration camp during World War II. And we walked through Birkenau where countless Jews were exterminated during that time period. By far, top three places that I've been in the world that are the darkest places that I've been. The heaviness and the death, the presence of evil that were almost tangible in that place that I had once learned about through history books when I was a student in school. But how many know it's much different to stand on the ground and to see that land where all of these heinous things took place? Can you see the parallels here? And in moments like this, it's very easy, no matter how much faith you have, to ask the question, where is God in all of this? How can God, how can God let something like this happen. And listen, I understand that it is hard to reconcile such evil things that take place. And, and it's hard to, to balance that out with a loving God who's supposed to be bigger than all of this. You know what's interesting about the book of Esther? That out of the 66 books of the entire Bible, the book of Esther is the only book in the Bible that does not mention God not one time at all. Not God, not Jesus, not Jehovah, not Adonai, not Yahweh, nothing, nothing. And in this particular moment, where Mordecai and the Jews find themselves faith, facing this proclamation of death, I'm sure that they must have felt like God was nowhere to be found. But just because the name of God wasn't mentioned at all, doesn't mean that the activity of God was not evident because what was about to take place would reveal that God's hand, God's sovereign hand was working this whole entire time. Because remember your girl, Esther? Remember where Esther now lives? Do you remember who Esther is now married to? Do you remember the crown that is on Esther's head? Do you remember the voice and the influence that Esther now has? You see, God was way ahead of things. He already moved everything into place as he often does, as he always does. You see, Mordecai in his desperation, he remembers that he's got someone on the inside. Can I tell you today, you got somebody on the inside. Jesus, the great high priest, has already gone before you into the holy of holies. I want you to read with me Esther chapter 4, verses 13 to 14. This is, this is Mordecai's words to Esther. He says, do not think, says this right to Esther, do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all of the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And I love these words. And who knows? but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I want to remind you today that although the days are evil and although evil is reality and although persecution is probable, we have a man on the inside. We serve a God that's got our back. God has your back this morning. And there might be moments of your story where you feel like God was absent, where you felt like he was missing in action, you felt like he was silent when you needed him most. 
But the reality is that he's been there for you all along and he's got your back. He goes before you. He stands behind you. He surrounds you on every side. He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And guess what else? He takes the things that the enemy meant for evil and somehow, some way, he turns them around and he will use them for your good. And we talked about Daniel a moment ago. Do you remember what he did for Daniel? He shut the mouths of the lions. You see, Daniel still ended up in the den. Did he not? He still ended up in the den. Daniel still had to go through the persecution. He still had to be subjected to the punishment. But God showed up and he said, Daniel, I got your back. I got your back. Do you remember what God did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? My Bible tells me that three men were put into the fire. But when they looked into the furnace, there was a fourth man standing with them in the fire. You see, the three Hebrew children, they ended up in the furnace. They still had to endure the consequences of not bowing down. But God showed up and he stood with them in the fire and he said, I got your back. I got your back. And Mordecai was about to find out that even though God isn't mentioned at all in the book of Esther, God had moved Esther into the right place at the right time to do the right thing, and the Jewish people would eventually be saved. Why? Because God had their back. And today, today, no matter what you're facing, no matter who is against you, no matter who is hating on you, who is persecuting you, no matter what kind of evil is harassing you, God's got your back. He is your shield and your strength. He is your refuge and your deliverer. And you might think that he's silent. You might think that he's absent. But he's with you in the fire and he's with you in the flood and he's with you in the darkness and he's with you in your depression he's with you in your deepest darkest fear he will come through for you but 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 like Mordecai you know what we have to do we need to have the boldness to not bow down to the things of this world there's only one name that I will bow down before. There's only one king that I will bow down in reverent worship. There's only one king that I will give all of my praise, all of my worship. There's only one, and his name is Jesus Christ. How about you this morning? Would you stand with me to your feet and would you just begin to lift up praise in this place? Just begin to lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, come on. Let's bow before him in our hearts this morning. Jesus, the highest honor, the highest praise. God, all of the glory, it's yours, Lord Jesus. God, we will not bow before any other name because there's no other name that can save except for the name of Jesus. Thank you for being a part of the CTI online family. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you'll be the first to know when we go live or share new content. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments about how this message has blessed you or if there's any way that we can pray for you. We so appreciate your time and we hope to see you again soon.